Mr. Speaker, clearly, there are 2016 records manifested a record of incompetence, a record of lack of understanding of the economy, a record that they themselves could not defend. Mr. Speaker, these were the taxes that the MPP administration inherited. There was a special 1% import levy. We had 17% VAT NHL on financial services, 17% on selected import medicines, imported medicines, and domestic airline tickets also attracted 17% VAT. Mr. Speaker, when we assumed office, all these taxes were abolished. They should go and read the 2017 budget. Is that removal of 1% special import levy, 17% VAT on financial services were exempted, and Mr. Speaker, excise duty on petroleum was removed. Duty on importation of spare parts was also removed. They should check their records. Today, they have made Dr. Baumia their target. And they want to pitch Mr. Muhammad the past to Dr. Baumia the future. You want to pitch him against Dr. Baumia, who is the future of this country? We we as a party and a government believe in diversity and we have told the whole country that in MPP you rise to eminence by merit irrespective of your religious background and the reason why Mr. Speaker we have for the first time demonstrated that by making him our flag bearer and leader of our party. And he is the man you are targeting. Mr. Speaker, you are targeting him. But I want to tell you Mrs. that, Mr. Speaker, these NDC folks in this chamber who are making Dr. Baumia their target have already failed. They have failed because, Mr. Speaker, only yesterday, they were in government. Atu Fawcett is always loud on this floor. Amar Kofibwa is cheering up to come and debate. But I want to remind him that the killer take or pay agreement is there. This government inherited this killer take or pay agreement in the energy sector. And we have succeeded in keeping the lights on. We have succeeded in keeping the lights on. Meanwhile, in your time, Doomso was the order of the day. Doomso was the order of the day. You could not keep the lights on. And you are the same crop of politicians who are trying to deceive Ghanaians again that you can do better. What did you do when you had a chance? The Mahama take where are to forcing economy. <laughs> the Mahama take where are to forcing economy. What did you do? But today, the liberties of opposition is making you believe that you have changed. What have you done? New. Mr. Speaker, this budget was read last week Wednesday. Today is another Wednesday. Any serious opposition will come out with an alternative budget. What are you waiting for? Do you have new ideas? What do you propose to tell Ghanaians? You are saying some 24-hour economy. So you are telling the municipal servant that at the Ministry of Health, they are going to work 24 hours. The Ministry of Finance, they work 24 hours at the Ministry. 
you are taking them, telling the ministries that you are going to work 24 hours. This is all you can tell Ghanaians. But today, what you could not do, we have done. And that you should know. You told Ghanaians that you could not implement free SHS. You told Ghanaians that you could not implement free SHS. That is what Dr. Forsen, Sir Tekwe, and Mr. Muhammad told Ghanaians. That's what you told Ghanaians. Even school feeding, you could not increase the quantum that you inherited from the JA Kufour administration. <laughs> Even common nursing training allowance, you said you could not pay. Common teacher training allowance, you could not pay. We came, we saw, we conquered. We have implemented this. Today, this same Mahama Tekwe Atu Forsen government have come before us, looking at us in, the, with, with, in our eyes, telling us that they can do better. What can you do better? Is it the past you want to revisit? Is it the past you want to revisit? What new have you to offer? But I can assure you that with Dr. Baumia as our leader, that Dr. Baumia that you've targeted is a man for the future and will defeat you at the polls. When the last time Dr. Baumia called for a debate, your running mate, Professor Nano Pokwajiman, said she was a literature professor, so she would not go into debate. And she ran away. I wonder whether she would be able to face a debate today. And unfortunately, you say you are ready for government. Since you elected your flag bearer, he has not been able to even select and announce a running mate. Is that the competence you are bringing on board? Your flag bearer has, has been given an opportunity to demonstrate his readiness to run the economy. Mr. Speaker, so far, this, this flag bearer of the NDC has failed a common decision and he is still dragging his feet. Clearly, you are an indecisive party. If you want to choose a two force, you should say so, so that we can combine them and tell the Ghanaians that this same a two force and his Muhammad failed them. Mr. Speaker, immediately you open to page 110, table 8. The bias statement immediately betrays the minister. Page 22. Page 22. The speaker, broad performance in industry has declined from 2017 when NDC handed over power. And today, it's in the negative, negative 2.2. Today, after seven years in office, the minister's own data has betrayed him. The speaker, I guess what? The manufacturing sector, which is a real heart and beat of this economy, has contracted from 9.5 in 2017 when NDC handed over to this government. That year, 2017, January 2017. Today, it is negative 1.1. We don't need a chief priest to tell us we are really on our knees as an economy. No. So, Speaker, there has been huge imposi imposition of taxes. And Mr. Speaker, let me quote the World Bank. This is very sad. Ghana has been ranked among 10 countries in the world with the highest food inflation, according to a food security report by the World Bank. And Mr. Speaker, we know why this is the case. Anytime you eat any food that is imported in the country, we saddle with 20 taxes. Import DT, 20%. Import VAT, 15%. ECOWAS levy, 0.5%. Network VAT, 15%. By the time I finish with the 20 taxes, a total of 70.5%. Mr. Speaker, are we not surprised that food inflation it's really off the roof. 
It gets worse, Mr. Speaker. If you look at the ease of doing business ranking, Ghana, the darling boy of ease of doing business, in 2012, we were out of 190 countries. By 2020, we had moved to 118. Mr. Speaker, and if you look at the criteria for ease of doing business, and the reason we have done so badly, it shows us why every business is collapsed. Every indicator is really shows that this government is simply not good for business. And the answers for the huge unemployment, everybody knows that the public sector cannot create the jobs we need in this country. Especially at a time when the public sector is on the uh, uh, IMF watch and there's freeze on public employment. What a caring government does is what? It's really create the conditions to allow the private sector to create jobs. Not, the, not in this case. Mr. Speaker, what is so sad is that this government, in an attempt to play to the gallery, created some impression that somehow they brought some tax relief. It is very loud. Mr. Speaker, let me commend you, because but for your vocal advocate on the Ah, you on, uh, the, you and the demonstration by women, that tax would not have been removed. Mr. Speaker, there's also a tax here for electric vehicles. Mr. Speaker, let me ask. In paragraph 695 of this budget, after that announcement of the electric vehicles waiver, the minister is betrayed in paragraph 695. In that paragraph, the minister himself indicated that to facilitate the adoption of electric vehicles, the Drive Electric Vehicle Initiative, which aims to establish standards and regulations, are being done by the Energy Commission. Mr. Speaker, the regulations and standards for electric vehicles are not even ready. It's in this budget. So who are we deceiving? In fact, where are the charging points? We don't have any. For task with it. Are they in Swami? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I take you to one of the main policies of this government. The one district, one factory. Mr. Speaker, this was the policy that they claimed was so well thought out. And this policy was supposed to help us to address the issue of employment. In fact, the minister predicted that by the time we are done, we are going to have 350,000 direct and indirect jobs. This policy was supposed to help us to spread industry, especially across every district in this country. This policy was supposed to really help, really so, uh, help local substitutes so that we can address the issues of imports. It will help us to increase exports and our foreign exchange will also be strong. That is really the focus. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, we are told that we have created 169 factories and 169,870 jobs. Far cry from the 350,000 jobs that was promised. Mr. Speaker, I guess what? What I'm really concerned about, how much money we have thrown at this policy. The last time I checked, Mr. Speaker, on tax exemptions, on stimulus packages, and on the risking of loans alone, we have spent 6.58 billion Ghana cities on the 1T1F program. Mr. Speaker, as we speak today, we have $49 million of tax exemption waiting in this house to be approved to 1T1F mattress. We simply ask the question, Mr. Speaker, the data is very clear. 80% of the 169 so-called factories, and I won't even go into questioning how they arrive at these factories. Because if I ask every member of parliament here, raise your hand and tell me you have a factory in your district. One, two, three. Three. Mr. Speaker, we don't have it. The original objective has failed. But Mr. Speaker, I guess what? 80% of the 
of these so-called one district, one factories are all concentrated in Greater Accra region, Eastern region, and Ashanti region. Fat. Mr. Speaker, it gets worse. Mr. Speaker, it gets worse. According to the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement, Mr. Speaker, we are exactly even worse off than we were when we started the 1D1F. He says that Ghana imports 500 million, and that is the 2020 report, million dollars worth of rice. Mr. Speaker, he says that we are only able to produce around about 47 of what we produce rice. What is even annoying is tomatoes. He says that the local production of tomato is 410 out of 1,088 million tons. And that we spend $720 million on the import of tomato. And guess what? Burkina Faso alone, we imported $120 million worth of tomatoes in 2022. Mr. Speaker, Ghana, according to the minister, spent in his 2019 budget, spent $2.9 million on food imports. Mr. Speaker, I will conclude on the 1D1 failure by the minister's own statement. He says, Ghana's heavy dependence on imports places tremendous pressure on the city, thus creating an unfavorable balance of payment position. On average, quoting the minister in 2023, Ghana's import bill exceeds $10 billion annually. Unquote. The Akufuado government took over was saddled with a lot of challenges. Key among them was the funding gap to how to tackle the road infrastructure deficit that we have in this country. Mr. Speaker, irrespective of these challenges, this did not stop the Akufuado government from making the necessary investment into the sector. And the records at the ministry indicate or shows so far the kind of investment the Kufuado government has made to the road sector. Mr. Speaker, if you read paragraph 36, bullet point 5 in the budget statement, it has clearly indicated so far within the seven years that the Kufuado government has been in power how much the government have pumped or invested into the sector. It's about 16 billion. This is the highest any government in our history has ever made into the rural sector. 16 billion. Mr. Speaker, there are several issues that are com being com uh, is confronted with the sector. The Kufuadu government inherited a sector with a total road network size of 78,402 kilometers. Mr. Speaker, in 2017, only 23%, which represent about 18,000 kilometers, were paved road in this country. What it means is that almost 77%, which is over 60,000, we're all on paved roads. It tells you the challenges and the difficulties that we are faced as a country. But Mr. Speaker, in view of all this, the Kufuadu government showed commitment and was determined to address these challenges and problems, making sure that we are able to resolve most, if not all, metro of our road infrastructure problems. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, within seven years, the government has been able to expand our road network, the size of our road network, from the 78,402 kilometers that we met to 94,203. We are talking about almost about 15,000 kilometers difference. Mr. Speaker, this is about 20% increase 
in terms of the expansion of road network. What it means is that there were several roads or several areas that did not have access routes. But under President Akufuan, all these areas now have access routes and cars, people can drive on it easily. Mr. Speaker, if you look at Appendix 4A on page 231 of the 2024 budget, government has indicated how much it is going to spend in 2024 only for capital expenditure under the rural sector. And we are talking about 3.4 billion. Mr. Speaker, here again, this is a huge investment, even though if you're looking at the challenges that we have faced in the sector, you will see it be insignificant. But this is a huge investment. If you are to compare to the previous investment, previous government have done, and it means this government is doing well. Mr. Speaker, I will move to Paragraph 729 of the 2024 budget, which talks about the dualization of key roads. The speaker, the Kufuado government is noted or is known for embarking on mega or legacy projects. The speaker, the Afanko, the Nsawam of Afanko Road, it has been there. The, MPP, the NDC was in power for eight years. Nothing was done about it. We saw how terrible this road was. Eight years in office, the government, the NDC government did not see it as important in tackling this road. Under President Okufuado, as you speak, we are building 10 lane roads with 11 foot bridges and four interchanges. Mr. Speaker, and when we talk about it, they will be asking, where is the money? Where is the money? This is investment, the kind of investment that the Kufuadu government is making to the road sector. Mr. Speaker, I will go on. If you read paragraph 3, 7.0, we are talking about dualization of Accra Kumasi Road. Eight years in office, the NDC government, even the little that President Kufuor Kufu started, they couldn't continue. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I want to report to this house that this government, the Kufuor government, is embarking on a serious and massive expansion of the Kumasi, Accra Kumasi Road. Four with four bypasses. Four bypasses. Mr. Speaker, we all know how deplorable the Kuma, Accra Kumasi Road is. It has claimed many lives. It has claimed many, several years. Several years. It has taken the Kufuadu and the MPP government to dualize the Accra Kumasi Road. And this is the legacy that we are talking about. It's not the noise that we make. This is the legacy. If you want to find out what the Kufuadu government has done in the road sector, we are talking about some of these legacy projects. A project that previous government have struggled, could not find the funding to do it, and the Kufuadu government today has gotten the funding and is doing it, and and creating four bypasses to make the road more trouble for everybody. Mr. Speaker, if I should go on, I can go on and give and give and give and give such mega projects. And Mr. Speaker, let me give you another mega project that the government is about to undertake, and that is the Accra Temamoto Way. This project was constructed, this road was constructed in 1965. It is 58 years old. That the Mamoto way has become a death trap, claiming many lives. 
and commuters on the road every day complaining about it. Today, I want to inform the House that the Ekufuadu government has concluded all arrangements and has selected four local contractors, a consortium of local contractors. We did not give it to foreign contractors to go and do it. We said we have the can do spirit in our own contractors. And they are going to construct the Temamoto Way, the phase one, which starts from Tetekwasi to the Tema end of the Moto Mr. Speaker, this is the mega project that we are talking. This is the legacy a Kufuadu government is going to leave for the good people of Ghana. And yet we are saying that the Kufuadu government has done nothing. All these roads were there. There have been several governments. It has taken the Kufuadu government to show to the Ghanaian people that he can. It has taken the MPP government to show to the Ghanaian people that they can. When I was listening to the speaker who came for the second time to finish his time, he reminded me of the vice president on a campaign platform. Promises, promises. After seven solid years, you are still telling us that you will do, you will do, not that you have done. You intend doing. If intentions were the reasons for which we are here, then obviously you would have won. But the issue is that you are supposed to show us exactly what you have done with the huge sums of money that was bequeathed to you and those that you borrowed as a government. But Mr. Speaker, the substantive issue that I want to talk about today, Mr. Speaker, has to do with the energy sector, <coughs> particularly the financial health of the power sector. Mr. Speaker, it is not by accident that if you look at the IMF program, the energy sector features heavily, particularly the level of indebtedness. Indeed, the IMF identifies the energy sector debt as a risk in collapsing this economy. And all of us will remember that in last year, when the Minister for Finance was called here, when he was being censured in this parliament, responding to the supposed 17.31 billion that was spent on excess capacity, he stated the real facts. He indicated that out of the 17.31 billion, 12.32 billion was for under recoveries. Mr. Speaker, what is under recoveries when it comes to the power sector? It means that your, the cost of generating electricity is more than the revenue that you collect. And so there is a shortfall. And that shortfall has to be taken care of by somebody. You and I know that we pay our electricity bills and every component that qualifies to be a cost is factored into the PRC tariff. So if you have a situation where government pays 12.32 billion between 2017 and 2020 for under recoveries, it tells you exactly that is a problem. And indeed, it is for this reason that as part of the strategy of the IMF, they indicated that there were two issues they needed to deal with. One had to do with the fact that we must have what we call cost-reflective tariffs. And the second point was that we must improve on the efficiency of our distribution system. These were the two main recommendations they gave to government. Mr. Speaker, the goal of this was that they were trying to see how they will relieve the national debt from this excessive under recovery, which by their own projections, between 2023 and 2026, will be up to 100 billion Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, if this is the case, the hope is that if they are able to institute these two particular policies, this $100 billion uh, Ghana cities will be used for other 
equally important uh, sectors. But the truth, again, can be said that if you look at the IMF conditionalities, they've already started with that. You and I know that the assumption that if you increase tariffs, you will enhance the liquidity position of the sector. They decided to ensure that between September 2022 and June 2023 this year, electricity tariffs have increased over 100 percent. However, the liquidity position of ECG and all the other functioning zones in the valley chain have not improved. Indeed, they have worsened. Mr. Speaker, the reason is that government in its own wisdom had indicated that they were going to institute what they call the cash waterfall mechanism. This is a particular mechanism where the revenue that is realized in the power sector is apportioned in a predetermined manner. And so you will know that as a fuel supplier, this is what I'm going to get. As this, this is what I'm going to get. The reason for this was to ensure that they will enhance collection and through the distribution of these revenues will be transparently done. But unfortunately, we do not have that. The cash waterfall mechanism has collapsed and its objectives have not been met. So even when ECG went on to indicate that they were going on what they call debt recovery a campaign, and their target was to realize 5.7 billion Ghana cities, ECG announced to us that in their exercise, they realized 3.1 billion. That's huge money. So obviously, all the players in the value chain expected that they will have something being done in terms of money that will be given to them. As we speak today, PURC, GNGC, GMPC, uh, Gritco, and all the other players are asking one simple question. Where is the money? The situation of ECJ has become even worse. And as I speak to you now, Mr. Speaker, if you look, for example, ECG owes WAPU $15.236 million. Indeed, it was for that reason that over two weeks ago, as part of the threat to government, they had indicated to government that out of this amount, at least $8.31 million should be paid for them to make sure that gas is, uh, is supplied to Tema. Government did not meet that. And so they could tell the supply of gas to the Tema enclave. Mr. Speaker, I sometimes wonder why my colleagues from the other side would don't want to tell the Ghanaian the truth. I hold in my heart or in my hands, Mr. Speaker, the 2016 budget presented to this August 13th November 2015 by Honorable Minister of Finance, Sir Tepe. And subsequently, Mr. Speaker, I have the, the mid-year budget review of the NDC in 2016. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I read paragraph 245. Mr. Speaker, since the presentation of the 2016 budget statement and economic policy to this August House in November 2015, and its subsequent approval, there have been a number of developments in both the global and domestic economic environment that has affected some of the assumptions underpinning the budget that was presented. The question is, did NBC at that time have any challenges of COVID? No. Do they have any challenges of Ukraine, Russia? No. But they were able to revise all the estimates and the revenue that they presented to this house, simply because they knew there were some challenges that they are facing. And today, they are telling Ghanaians that there was no challenge of this particular country. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I read paragraph 273 of their budget. Right, Honorable Speaker, we are committed to address the significant economic challenges towards the realization of our better medium term prospects. We have remained focused despite the turbulent weather. As 
evidence in the significant progress that has been made in the body. Mr. Speaker, I want to find out what was the temperate water that they passed through and what was the vehicle that they were using to pass through the temperament water. Is it the bath branding or is it the guinea fowls that they used to pass through this water and they were fixing this temperament in the water? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me find out from the NDC that we all experience the global challenges and recession in this particular world. Mr. Speaker, with your good self and with your permission, last two weeks, I and my colleagues from the other side have the opportunity to visit Sierra Leone and we witnessed their budget presentation by them, their Minister of Finance. And Mr. Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, it took the Minister of Finance of Sierra Leone 20 minutes to actually state or emulate the challenges that the country went through, the global uh, recession and the COVID. But today, my friends on the other side is telling the Ghanaians that they are the better managers of this economy. Yeah. Ghanaians are not prepared to return to doom so. Yeah. Ghanaians are not prepared to witness bad branding. Ghanaians are not prepared to witness the flow of uh, the Guinea files into the Burkina Faso, whether we have money to bring them back or not. <laughs> and we are not ready that the barbers are not getting light to actually work. Hairdressers are not getting light and tailors are not getting light. And we are not prepared to return to this particular uh, incompetent government of the Andes. Mr. Speaker, government through Nana Rodankwa Akufuado has invested heavily in the railway sector. And we can talk of Tema in Pakadam, which is almost completed, 98% completed. Government the funding in your budget, there was no expression in our budget for 2016, and even the media budget review, there was no expression that you are going to construct the Tema and Pagadan uh, project. Mr. Speaker, government is committed to finish the Manso to Winibari uh, line and also to construct an additional line to the port of Takradi. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the government of Ghana through Nana Rodankwa Akufuado, as my chairman of the committee has actually stated, has invested heavily and has laid a good foundation of this country. And we need to applaud this government of all these challenges and the global recession that we are facing in this country. And Mr. Speaker, we all know that the roles that have been mentioned, specifically in terms of the consequences and let me attest to it that, Mr. Speaker, it is only the MPP government that normally takes care of our rules in the Western North. And my friends from the other part of the Western North can actually attest to this particular um, statement that it is only the MPP government that will be able to reconstruct the severe contract to serve you also, Benjamin Quanta to Asampane, and my friend from Bia West. Honorable TV, I can attest to it that it is 2019 that thought was cut to construct this particular route. Mr. Speaker, I want my friends from the other side that Ghanaians are weak. Ghanaians are not ready to return incompetent NDC into government again. And we are preparing that the foundation that Nana Rodankwa Akufuado has laid that foundation will be continued by His Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic. Thank you. And the idea is that the name of Baumia is giving them a headache. And we believe that the Ghanaians will renew the mandate of the MPP coming 2024 for us to continue the foundation. And Mr. Speaker, as the Bible said, and I quote, in Zachariah chapter 4, verse 9, the hands that have laid the foundation, that hands must complete the foundation. We have laid a foundation for free senior high school, which my minister is here to talk about it. We have laid good foundation for our rules. We have laid good foundation for our railways and other sectors. And I believe that given the opportunity to rule in another four years, Ghanaians will feel it better that the NDC come into power to spend eight years and plug this country into doomsaw, plug this country into a hardship. We are not ready. 
and Ghanaians will never forgive then DC that they are bringing back John Mahama. We know that the former president is incompetent. The former president cannot manage this economy. He has an opportunity to rule this country for eight years. And within four years, look at what he went through, look at what he plugged Ghana into. And we are not ready to experience doing so. We are not ready to experience bad branding. We are not ready to experience the Guinea Files situation again. In this note, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.